Аллилуйя, Аллилуйя, Аллилуйя. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Along the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter said to him in reply, you are the Christ. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and rise after three days. He spoke this openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him at this he turned around and looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. He summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. The Gospel of the Lord. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but not, it does not have works? These words of the Apostle St. James in his letter that we hear in the second reading are words that can be offensive to, to many. Indeed, even his letter in some editions of sacred scripture that are so popular today is completely removed. I'd rather not have to hear about faith and works as professed by the apostles. It doesn't fit into my worldview. And so they just take it out of sacred scripture. Can you believe it? And yet, how many of us rely so much on sacred scripture to have our faith? And some would even say, scripture alone, sola scriptura, is enough for my salvation. And so, so often is this letter of St. James, of one of the apostles of the Lord himself, taken out of that foundational text for some. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? And we can see how that plays in our very lives. We can see how that changes people's attitude to suffering, to um, disgrace, to evil in the world. If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and has no food for the day, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well. And you do not give them the necessities of the food, what good is it? How can we declare to someone who's starving, who's cold, eat well and, and, and stay warm? And we're unwilling to act upon that very faith act upon that call of the Lord to love our neighbor. And so we consider now, what does it mean to have faith? What does it mean to have faith? Do you believe that each and every one of us understands that very word itself the same? Do we know what it is to believe? And where that belief, where that faith will then take us? At the time of the Reformation, an English king who didn't like the fact that he couldn't just divorce his wife and find another one. Um, 
didn't like the fact that he was bound in a sacramental marriage, uh, just separated from the church, refused the authority of the Pope. And in addition to that very fact, he who was recognized as such a good witness to the faith and the fullness of the faith, that is, um, the universal faith of Christ's church, he, he was given the title of defender of the faith because he was one who, was, um, one who would support the very gospel of Jesus Christ. But then, finding it to be difficult, disassociated himself from the church, that is, the mystical body of Christ, but still retained the title of the defender of the faith. And those who were his successors continued to hold to it, even to Queen Elizabeth this day, the defender of the faith. Now we hear sadly that others in line of succession are already saying, I'm not going to say the faith, I'm just going to say defender of faith. Now changing what it means to believe in what we are defending. So what is it that you and I profess when we declare the faith? And the faith is something that is um, certainly one that we hold individually. Oh, this person is a great person of faith. What does that mean? Oh, this person um, held to the faith the whole of their lives. Well, does that mean that they happen to go to church every day? Does that mean that they celebrated Christmas and Easter in a special way? Or how they celebrated the birth of a child? and baptism, and nice garments? Or does it mean that we have, individually and in communion, a relationship with Jesus Christ? Does it mean that we actually believe in what Jesus himself says, and not merely what he does, or how it feels, or what we've heard as a story? Even some would consider fiction. Does our faith actually allow us to have a deep and intimate relationship with the Lord? And does our faith represent the very rock of our lives, the very foundation of what we do and how we go through these years that the Lord gives us? Do we not hear how Jesus is walking with his disciples to a place of great mysticism and great belief, Caesarea Philippi, but not particularly foundational faith, not rooted in the great mysteries of God, but certainly in the mysteries of the universe. And he's asking them, who do people say that I am? And they're starting to say, well, some people are saying John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets, you know, something out there, something that we've seen already before. But then, he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, a man of passion, one who's the fastest of runners and the quickest of stumblers, St. Peter says, you are the Christ. So now he's making a declaration of faith. You're not like everything else we've seen. You're not like what we've heard before. You are the Christ the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Anointed One. And, and, and he begins to show them by his words and, and invite them into a deeper understanding of what it means to believe. And how is he telling them? All good stories and wonderful things and the power and majesty of God, vanquishing demons and doing all those works. No, he begins to share that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and rise on the third day. He spoke this openly. He said this directly to those who would be his disciples, to those who would believe. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Hold on, Jesus. We don't talk like that. This is not what we do. He takes him aside because he can't understand 
now what this belief in the Christ is going to mean. At this he turned around and looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as humans being do, human beings do. You are thinking not as God does. And so there is this movement of faith that moves us from thinking as we once did, thinking as everyone seems to do, thinking as the world does, and to move into a deeper relationship to think as God does. To think as God does. Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And so as men and women of faith, we begin to recognize, and I pray that you and I and each and every one of us, in the time that God gives us, come to understand a little bit more deeply, a little bit more intimately with Christ, what it means to believe. Because to have faith doesn't mean that your back won't be struck, doesn't mean that your beard won't be plucked, as we heard in our first reading today. To have faith doesn't mean that somehow we will not die from grave illness, somehow that we will be spared the sorrow or the loss of a loved one. Faith is not some magic formula to make life beautiful and great always. But what it means to have faith is to know Christ and the very message of the gospel that says, the Lord is my help, that the Lord is my salvation. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living and not in the land of death. I will walk with the Lord who is by my side. And even in those darkest of days, even in that deepest of suffering, I am not alone. And the Lord, who himself suffers and knows that he will suffer, invites me to take up my cross every day and follow him. And if I follow him, then I know that with him I will be raised. He said it openly. So dear friends, as we face the challenges of our life, let us not be duped into thinking that we will not suffer. Let us not be duped into thinking that to believe means that somehow we are spared the challenges of life. But let us know that when we believe, we are already promised the greatest gift, that is the salvation of our souls, that is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we know that there is suffering, especially as we celebrate this 20th anniversary of the attacks of September 11th. But it is precisely in those darkest of moments that we begin to see the greatest good of man and the works that we do in support of one another, in caring for one another, in rising up to the challenge of helping our brother in need, the ones who are hungry, the ones who are cold, the ones who are suffering. God gives you and I the strength to believe, that is to have faith, the strength to act, to engage in good works. Let us not be duped, but let us be truly men and women of faith and acts. Amen.